Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode number 77, recorded November 7th, 2012, Penny Arcade. Triangulation is brought to you by Stamps.com. Start using your time more effectively with Stamps.com. Buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, go to Stamps.com, click the radio microphone, and enter Triangulation. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, 3D models, and more, check out Pond5.com. And for an exclusive 15% off this month, use our offer code TRIANGULATION11. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com. Slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. I'm Tom Merritt, filling in uh, for Leo Laporte, who is off on his Australian cruise. He's on the entirely other side of the planet, in the southern hemisphere, where the water goes backwards. Uh, but it gives me the distinct pleasure of being able to fill in on Triangulation and talk to some great guests we have with us today. Penny Arcade, Jerry Hulkins, and Mike Krahulik, or you might know them better as Tycho and Gabe. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Hi. Welcome to the show. You know, I'm so used to Skype lag and, and freezing that I just figured that that's what was going on there. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, we, sure. we got a little lag over here. Yeah. Why are you? Uh, I'm being waved at. <laughs> oh, he's waving at Burke. So we're off to a smooth start. Uh, of course, uh, Jerry Holkins, uh, you are mostly known as Tycho. Uh, True. I, I think in the in the penny arcade world for sure, and on the internets. And and Mike, uh, you go by Gabe. But you, you guys answer to either one. Yeah, at at this point, it's been fourteen years. Yes, yeah. it's like a name. It's it's my name now. Yeah, this this month is fully fourteen years. Is it fifteen? It's four, it was started in ninety eight, right? It's November of ninety eight to November of two thousand twelve. That sounds like math. That's too much math for that's me. That's uh, yeah, especially after the election last night. That's yeah. There, there, that took all the math out of me. Uh, that's right. But when you when you if, if I understand it right, when you started Penny Arcade, the characters were just characters because Mike, you do the illustrations and and uh, Jerry, you do you do the writing, and these characters weren't supposed to be you. No, no, the, the characters were. Their purpose was simply to be. It was like puppets. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the, the drawings of the characters were just meant to be sort of um, viewpoints. They were never meant to be full characters or to have any kind of continuity associated with them, let alone to be representatives of us directly. It's, it was pretty strange. So, and so and they got larger hair as time went on, too, I've noticed. Uh, how, how did True. the first part come about? How, how did they start to become you? How did you pick which one of you was Gabe and... Which one was you? Was uh, that it was pretty moment? natural. Uh-huh. I mean, honestly, we didn't really pick it. it. It just sort of happened. We realized, I think, at some point that this one with the black hair was saying all the things that I said. Right. And they were your lines, basically. Yeah. And this one over here was saying, you know, all the things that, that Jerry said. So it really just happened naturally. Now, Jerry, you're writing the lines. Did you did you start to kind of speak in the voices? Yeah. I mean, the, the, truth, the truth of the matter is that we is that I write the post that accompanies a strip by myself, and he does the art by himself, but the writing is actually a collaborative process, and if I had to write it all by myself, I'm not sure that we would be doing it. Like, it, we wouldn't. It, it wouldn't be very good either. Yeah, we, we, have, a, we have a thing. Like, we have a rapport. Uh, we have a raptor. <laughs> we have a we have a velociraptor. That's the key to most good writing, right there. Yeah, it's super dangerous. Obviously, it's the um, fear that brings out the the, the best. I think. <clears throat> well, yes, yeah, that fear. It's those human emotions. Um, but no, I mean, we we write them together, and so a lot of times you just you'll just sort of kick out a line, and then you know you'll if you've ever seen like a professional like writing type room, like we didn't understand that this is how it worked, but a lot of times people would just speak to each other as characters. Like that's not. That's not strange. You know what I mean? 
And um, a lot, a lot. Eventually, we just sort of we realized that we had sort of made these doppelgangers without intending to. That's a, so. You kind of naturally evolved along the lines that that TV writers break a story. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. How did you guys meet? How did you guys get together and and start doing this? Uh, it was in high school, uh, my junior year and his senior year. We were both in uh, the news production, newspaper production class, so the class that actually makes the school paper. And uh, I was there to be the uh, staff cartoonist. Um, he was writing articles. And I think on that first day, uh, I had brought in my portfolio to show the teacher that, hey, I can actually draw cartoons and, you know, I'm, you should let me do this. Yeah, put me to work. Yeah. And uh, Jerry walked over and, and looked at it. I think he, he liked a couple of the drawings, and I remember we had a conversation about the stories that I was uh, writing. I was trying to make my own comic books. And the story part for me was the, the boring, tedious part. That's the busy work. That's the busy work. I just wanted to draw, and I hated having to come up with stories, and, and I, you know, the relationship was born. And that was, what, early 90s or so? Uh, it would have been 94 yeah, 94, because I graduated in 95. Up in the Seattle area? No, we actually grew up in Spokane on the east side of Washington. It's about okay. four hours east. Um, in, uh, Unless you have kids in the car, in which case it is infinite hours. <laughs> it's a, there is time dilation that happens when children are present, I know. Uh. So, uh, so you didn't start Penny Arcade until 98, and I, and I want to get to that because... Uh, you you definitely have been trendsetters in a, in a lot of different ways for things that have become sort of commonplace on the internet. Uh, and but but how did you get from being you know high school buddies who had this natural relationship? They, you still sounds like you have you know you do you do most of the writing and you, and you do most of the drawing or you do all the drawing. I'm, I'm guessing, right? Oh so, yeah, it's for the best. You're welcome to look through our archive. I think there's like three strips that I've done, and it's it's nightmarish. <laughs> So how did what happened in between the interregnum uh, between school newspaperdom and uh, and the launch of Penny Arcade? Um, we just we we happened to remain friends. Like I didn't I didn't really remain friends with most people that I knew in high school, but Mike and I remained friends for some reason. I don't, I don't know why. We always intended to make different kinds of projects, and we 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 had done a couple of comic projects before, but they were very like sort of traditional like image comics or Marvel comics, like they were action adventure superhero type comics. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they were nothing like comic strips, and they were a lot of work for us to produce because our our sort of attention span just isn't it's, it's not great it's not great two three panels and, at most deteriorated with time so you know what i mean like so basically what we were doing was uh just sort of like we would push ourselves to make these and it wasn't until we entered a, a contest much later um for next generation online they wanted a, a, a cartoon strip for their website um and Mike had seen that because we were reading that site and he decided to put a few in and I asked him if I could write a couple and the idea to do Penny Arcade isn't even our idea. So, so you, but you guys did, how did you do in the contest? Oh, we didn't win. We failed. <laughs> we failed miserably. They told us, they, they literally told us not to send any more comics. They, they, yeah, they took the trouble to tell you that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, we kept sending comics thinking that, well, maybe this will be the one that does it that, it that wins us this competition? Yeah, because because essentially it was it was a process of iteration. Uh -huh. Like you're supposed to send in one comic, and by the time it was done, we had sent in five. Like five, essentially, yeah. like trying to improve. Like each time, we had a different idea that we thought might be more effective, and it didn't say we couldn't enter five times. Yeah, so no, they absolutely took the time to uh, to tell us to shut up. <laughs> uh, well, that that did that motivate you to try to do Penny Arcade on your own or? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you know, we, we had these five comic strips uh, sitting around that we thought were funny and that no one was going to see, you know. Uh, and so at, at the time, it was actually pretty difficult to start your own website. There was no live journal or Tumblr or anything like that. I mean, yeah, you're talking uh, Angel Fire days, GeoCity. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But assuming you wanted to go on a template. Yeah. 
But I mean, like, I mean, we, we, we wanted something that was pretty much like the whole deal, like FTP, like, like we're real, like a big person website. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and so what we did instead was we, we sent the comic strips out to the, the top, like, I don't know, four or five big websites at the time. Like I remember, um, was it, uh, Telefrag, Telefrag, you know, uh, Quake, Quake, Planet, Planet Quake, Planet Quake. Right. Like all the all the big all the big gaming sites, and we said, "Hey, if you guys want to post these, please do. You know, we want people to see them." And uh, at the time, Looney Games, uh, which was sort of an online zine, it just started. Yeah, I mean, imagine a web, imagine a gaming website that updated once a day. <laughs> Try to imagine that era. Yeah, that was a, back then, and that was frequent. At yeah, the time. yeah, yeah. I Content. remember those days. Uh, he was the only one that responded and said, yeah, yeah, well, I'll post him. And he did. So, um, but it wasn't really our intention to keep doing them. And I think that he was under some misconceptions about that. The idea was that we had done all this work and no one would see it. Not that we wanted to become professional cartoonists. Mm -hmm. right? You know? Yeah. And so we sent them over there and then he was like, okay, well, you know, it, it, it'll run on Mondays and... Was it Monday back it was, then? It was every Monday. It was a new strip, and then he he ran through the strips we had given him, and sent a mail asking for the next strip. <laughs> we were like, "Oh, sh we better make another strip." Now, was he giving you a commission for these, paying you anything, or was it just for exposure? No. Yeah. No. Well, you know, that first year he he took us to E3. That's right. He was able to get us press credentials to um, attend E3, which was the first time to us was basically infinity dollars. Yeah, that was payment enough. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I I remember all. I I had a uh, a little e zine. These are back in the days of e zine around that same time, yeah, and it was easy to get really good people to write for you because at the time nobody was doing that stuff, and so you wanted the exposure. You wanted the world wide web. You, like you said, like you guys said, you wanted to, people to see what you did. Right. Well, yeah, it was starting to become clear that there was a world wide web but i mean this is pre google don't forget i mean this is a long time ago this is right infoseek days alta vista <laughs> yeah right? babel fish um but, i mean at that time like being seen was was that was really the thing it was that people could see it and find it and that meant being on the big sites regardless of any you know democratic uh you know vibration you might get from the internet people still had to be able to find it yeah, it was. A, I remember really uh, punching my web rings and Link Exchange. <laughs> yeah, Link Exchange. Oh, Link Exchange. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And then, so did you ever? Did you ever go into a phase where you got onto one of those like uh, ad networks, and it's like they would pay you like ten cents per click, and so you would go click your own <laughs> a bunch of times. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. I even I like asked friends like, hey, do you mind just you know. Click on. You understand? You know, when young people watch this, they're going to think that we're talking about like getting sap out of a maple tree, yeah. <laughs> boiling it down. You yeah. know what I mean? Like this is not the internet that that people use today at all. No, it, it definitely it was different, and 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 it must have been different creating the comic. I mean, you didn't have uh, cheap Wacom tablets and touch screens and 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 that. I mean, what tools did you guys use to to ah. make it? Uh, when the comic started, I was drawing the strip uh, out with a pencil, inking it with, you know, uh, micron black pens. I would then uh, scan it in and finish it in, if you can believe this, Corel 3. <laughs> I, you know, I feel a Corel bond. I was using WordPerfect in its Corel phase at around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't actually end up going, uh, you know, digital until much, much later. So, so you would just draw and draw and scan, essentially, right? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that was, that was the only way to get it into the computer. <laughs> like, draw, ink, scan, draw over, right. color. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it was a completely traditional. Um, it was a completely traditional art process. Yeah. And then today, I just just to fast forward, what do you use today? Uh, I have an Intuos tablet, uh, and so I just draw right into Photoshop. Um, there's no physical component. There's no real-world component to the strips anymore. You don't have some sort of nostalgic impulse to, you know, do an old-school week where you, you hand-draw or anything? 
Uh, there have been a couple times where we go to conventions or something like that where I might sketch out the strip. Um, and on bigger projects like, uh, you know, when we did the Zelda comic for Nintendo, mm -hmm. I drew all of those out um, definitely in a sketchbook first. Yeah, and anything that anything that's sort of longer form, you'll have a super rough outline at least yeah. just to do panel construction, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to talk about how you made uh, the transition into Penny Arcade being your own site, uh, but let's take a quick break. Uh, Leo has got a word from our sponsor for us. Triangulation is always brought to you by our good friends at Stamps.com. We're going to get back to our great guest in a moment, but i got to tell you, if you are still going to the post office, stop the insanity. Go to Stamps.com instead on your web browser and sign up today. Stamps.com. It means you never have to go to the post office again. Not only can you print official, you don't need a postage meter. You don't need special ink. You're going to save 80% off leasing a postage meter. You just use your, what you've already got, your computer, your printer, and stamps.com. Mac or PC, stamps.com is the easiest way to do mm -hmm. mailing. If you do a lot of mailing with the postal service, you've got to try stamps.com. Much better than a postage meter. You get discounts you can't get at the post office. They pull the information right from the website, Amazon, eBay, PayPal, you know, whatever it is you're selling on if you're one of the... But, you know, even if you're, like, sending out invoices, it'll use uh, your QuickBooks address book. It'll pull the addresses from there. Prints right on the envelope with your logo and a great-looking stamp, plus the address and return address, or print mailing labels for packages of any size. Mail carrier comes and gets it. I mean, it's beautiful. Stamps.com. You even uh, can do international and certified mail with Stamps.com. It'll fill out all the forms and send an email to the person who's uh, getting the, uh, the mailing. I mean, all of this is great. It is modern. It's the modern way to manage your mailing. I'll tell you what. I want you to try it. In fact, I want you to try it so much I've arranged a very special offer. Not the $80 bonus offer you see on the front page at Stamps.com, but a special one. Now, here's how it works. See the microphone up there in the... Uh, upper right-hand corner, click that, and enter our offer code, triangulation, and you will get, you will get this $110, see that? $110 bonus offer, $55 free postage, you get the scale, you get a month of stamps.com, and I'll tell you what, don't do this unless you're ready to buy, because I'll, you're going to love it. You'll never want to go back to the old way of doing things. Stamps.com, click the radio microphone. Use our offer code TRIANGULATION. We thank Stamps.com for their support of TRIANGULATION. Back to the show. It's like watching Triangu the pr Price is Right while you guys... Because <laughs> I could see you during the, the commercial. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, driven, we were driven mad by the, that incredible offer. I'm going to Stamps.com. <laughs> this is over. Excellent. Uh, we, we appreciate their support. And your support of their support. It's just yeah. it's a whole big circle. So... It's Go full ahead. duplex support. Ah, yeah. That kind of redundancy you can't pay enough for. Uh, so you, you were on Looney Games. They, he had tricked you into becoming cartoonists. Uh, and you were, you, were, you were off to the races. Uh, what happened that, that moved you into your own site? Uh, and, and why didn't you decide, like, oh, you know, this, this was fun, but now it's come to an end? You know, it's funny. Um, it has, you know, like so many great things, it has a lot to do with the F word. Mm-hmm. Fun. Um, yeah. Uh, no, not that one. There's another Other one. funners? No. Um, so what happened was, you know, we... A comic strip, as a form, generally speaking, is, you know, as an American institution, is a paper, it lives on the paper, right? It, specifically, like, in newspaper. And that's even more true, you know, back in 98 when we were doing that stuff, right? I mean, now... That's not that's not really a thing that that medium is in super trouble. But back then, you know, you could aspire to that. And there are, you know, editorial guidelines that go into the creation of that type of content so that it can be presentable everywhere. And we didn't really want to be presentable everywhere. It seemed like we had an opportunity to do things that you couldn't do in a newspaper strip. And one of those would be to use, you know, the regular kind of language that we use every day. Yeah, just talk but, like people talk, in other words. Yeah, um, uh, that's, at any rate, talk the way we talk. Some people don't do that. Sure. But that's, but that's totally normal for us. And so we included what you might, you know, what Dragon might call natural language. Um, in <laughs> Dragon the, in naturally the, cursing? That's right, yeah. in the body of the strip. 
and uh, we were told that the F word was not funny and that we had to change it. And that's, you know, we were young, we were young men then. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we would deal with something like that now. Still Probably poorly. Similar, like, yeah. Still poorly, but at the time, it was... It was the man. At the time, exactly. At the time, it was thermonuclear. I wasn't about to, I wasn't about to be told how to write the script I was writing for... Sorry. <laughs> that was the about, word. That was the word he was talking about. I write out. See, that's been the problem historically. <laughs> So I, I wasn't about to be told. By the way, you get the belt. That's a uh, Twit Network tradition when someone curses. Uh, that's it, you. You get a, you get an award. I'm into that. Yeah, right. I'm into that. That's fine. So let's, if you see our chat room in the IRC, they're all going belt, belt. That's that's. I, I'm into that. Yeah. Let's make it happen. But what I'm saying is that uh, for something that I was doing for free. I, I wasn't going to accept any kind of editorial control. It was going to, it was a product offered as is, and you can put it up or not put it up, but you certainly can't tell me what I'm going to put in it. Um, and so at that time, we essentially jumped ship. Um, I mean, at that point, I think both of us knew enough very basic HTML to, uh, to code that first Penny Arcade site. Um, Which was gruesome, but yeah. you know, it, 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 would, it would parse in your browser. Yeah, you it know, would I mean, be interpreted it, logically. That's right. That's right. We had some pretty busted frame code in there. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but at, back at that time, I mean, do you remember? You know, obviously, this is going way back. But like, um, old man Murray. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had made friends with, you know, what is essentially like to this day still the best gaming humor, in my opinion. Wow. It's okay. Good. You can go back and look at it, and it's still the best. That takes me back. Yeah. But we had made, you know, we had made friends with them, and now obviously they work at Valve and. That's a whole other story, but at the time, you know, they had equipment to host our stuff on, um, and they essentially gave us Harbor um, to host our own stuff and FTP access, and so we just maintained the strip going forward from there. And, and you, so you just grabbed the domain name? Was that pretty much your only cost? Yeah, we, we couldn't get it without the dash. Uh -huh. so Penny dash arcade.com is all we could get. I was going to ask you about that because you still resolve pennyarcade.com to the penny with the dash, right? Yeah, I mean, at this point, that's, I mean, penny dash arcade.com, I think that's what how people know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was funny because when we were first trying to, a long time ago, as young people, when we tried to sell ads and do the site like as our job, <laughs> yeah. people would always say, that, listen, that dash, you got to get rid of that dash. Nobody's going to find your site. The dash is a huge problem, guys. Yeah. The site's never going to take off. The International Arcade Museum is going to stomp you guys if you. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so you you uh, you found Safe Harbor. You found somebody who's willing to to give. This is a common story. I I, I feel like where you know oh, people yeah. sort of luck into to friends on the internet. People who are willing to help out because they just like what you're doing. Uh, but the thing is, for all of those stories, most of them end up. Uh, you know, uh, folding after a while or the partnership, whether it's through acrimony or just, just through people getting different offers and, go, and going other ways, don't stay together. What do you think has kept you guys together and kept the site growing in popularity for 14 years? Well, I, I think that a big part of it, I mean, this is something that we try not to think about too much because obviously there's the jinx factor. We want to try to minimize the jinx aspect. It's like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Exactly, exactly, but for humor. And, you know, the reality is that, you know, acrimony, like you said, like us not liking each other, well, that's actually built into the relationship. It's built into the strip, mm -hmm. and it's built into the creative relationship, where it is a kind of competition to outdo each other and try to make something that, that will impress the other person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the the idea that I, I'm almost certain that if you did not base your relationship around that completely natural, normal force, you would probably run aground on it. But we accept that we don't like each other a lot of the time, and you know our our archive is full of actual fights that we managed to turn into comic strips. Yeah, I mean the reality is there are times where you know uh, I'll say something especially mean and really hurtful to him. Uh, and, you know, he'll take a second to process that and then he'll shove it down deep inside and say, you know what, that'd be pretty good for a comic. Well, that seems like a key to me. Uh, <laughs> why are you laughing? 
<laughs> but that's just it. Like, you know, our purpose is to amuse. And if, if, if the, you know, if we can amuse you by debasing ourselves and each other, <laughs> I don't care. I do not care why you laugh. I have, I have no interest in that. Yeah. There, I, there's an executive producer from L.A. that I met one time who said the way you succeed is to be willing to do anything for a laugh. That's kind of what you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we think of ourselves as as like pieces that we can just sort of move around on a board and eventually we'll find configurations of these, you know, in this relationship that are funny to other people. Like it's completely depersonalized. Yeah, it's really bizarre. I mean, there are people who don't like being laughed at. And for for us, as long as they're laughing, like, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Like, if I fall down and people laugh, I'm like, wow, got him to laugh. He'll fall down again. Yeah, I will slip again. (laughs) I'll I'll fall down again and again. Well, uh, what I was going to say is that seems to be the key, right? Which is you not only uh, have built the relationship to be honest about the fact that when you work creatively and closely with somebody at a certain point you're gonna hate each other and i think that's true of any relationship whether it's it's marriage or business or or anything there are points where you just are not gonna like each other very much so you're saying first of all we just expect that you build that in and don't let that worry you but then you go the extra step and this is where I, I, it, I think it's not everybody can do this and say how do we turn it to our advantage how do we turn that into something creative and make people laugh yeah you have to use that yeah, because it's incredibly powerful. Like the grudge, I mean this this site and this business is essentially fueled by a grudge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that is there's a lot of pretty strong, pretty commonplace human emotions and we don't throw those out. You know what I mean? Like we we keep those in the in the crock pot so to speak. All right, we're going to take another uh, break for one of our sponsors. Well, when we come back, uh, we'll have them explain how all of that rage and anger helps children. I interrupt to mention a great sponsor for this and many of our shows, Pond5. Have you heard me talk about them? Uh, the best way to describe them is a stock media marketplace, a place where you can go to buy stock photos, videos, illustrations, music and sound effects, even things like 3D models and After Effects templates. They've got millions of them at pond5.com. And if you're a creator, and most people, by the way, are both, but if you shoot video or take pictures, it's a great place to sell your stuff too. This is why I like Pond5, because it benefits both sides of the transaction. You get the highest... Excuse me, the highest royalty rate anywhere, 50%, and you set the price. So it's really an artist-friendly marketplace. That's why you should shop at stamps.com, too, because you know it's fair. Everybody's getting their fair share. Uh, More than 10 million professional quality photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, motion graphics, templates, 3D models, and more. The collection, if you go to the website, you'll see is growing by leaps and bounds every day. And all the content on Pond5 can be downloaded instantly for legal use in any media production at the best prices anywhere. It's royalty-free. You pay once and get to use it as much as you want. Pond5. Now, here's a special deal. You're going to save 15% on your purchase this month when you use our special triangulation offer. It's Triangulation 11 for the month of uh, November. Triangulation 11. It's Pond5. P-O-N-D5.com. 50% I'm, uh, off. I'm canceling my subscription to Pond4 today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's uh, actually five times better than the original Pond. That's a waste of money. I've been, <laughs> I really got screwed on that well, deal. Yeah. Well, the royalty rate's not as high. No. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And uh, it also always constantly getting confused with Pond Far. Uh, then you got okay. broken women throwing themselves at you. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's a whole other, uh, whole other thing. Kingy in the chat room. By the way, this is triangulation because we have our guests, we have me, and we have our chat room. Uh, and Kingy was wanting to know, uh, Mike, if you actually did consider dressing as Windows 8 for Halloween. I know what strip he's <laughs> referring to. That one made me laugh. Uh, you know what? That I have children. And they would be terrified. I mean, yeah. I can't do that. You can't them. do that around children. I'd scar, I would scar them. <laughs> the tiles! Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, go, folks, if you haven't, by the way, to penny-arcade.com. One thing, you guys were talking about how hard it was to get the site together and, and the code breaking and all of that stuff back in the early days, but i got to commend you. It is the best working 
webcomic site I've ever used. Uh, because I, it, in, in preparing for the show today, I was like, oh, I want to go back and look at the very first one. And I clicked that little double arrow button. That never works anywhere. It went right to your, your very first comic. So, so kudos on that, by the way. I mean, that, we are very lucky that we've got some incredible designers here. I mean, Penny Arcade at this point, you know, it's not just Jerry and I. I think, I think there's 13 or... It's like Ocean's Eleven now. Yeah, we've got like 13 people that all work at Penny Arcade. They're all super good at something. Do yeah. you fund it with bank heists? <laughs> yeah. Opt- yeah, under optimal circumstances. Yeah. So we were talking before about how we just accept that human rage is a part of our thing. Sure, right, right. But the other thing that we accept, and I, I think that this is just because it might interest you, the other thing that we accept is that we don't know everything all the time. Uh-huh. And for people who are starting a business, I think that maybe that can be very difficult. And certainly it was true for us. When we started out, we sort of thought that, oh, well, you can, anybody can do business. Business, uh, mm, eh. it's yeah. not true, actually. It turns out that people have specialties and they have things that they like to do that they can do for an unlimited amount of time. And they have unlimited energy for. And so, you know, whenever we find something that needs doing, we try to find somebody who would be doing that anyway, <laughs> alone in, in their room at night. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a, that is a great point because I definitely was raised to think, you know, you should be able to do everything yourself. You know, plant your own food and kill your own deer and, you know, like, right. and, sure. and the only reason we don't is because the world's broken. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and so, so you, you grow up with that kind of message and you, you think, well, if I, like you said, when I start a business, I should be able to do everything, but we don't all like the same things. And that's not a nece- that's not a bad thing. That's not a thing to be ashamed of, uh, no, any more than it's a shame. It's no one should be ashamed if they like doing tax accounting or, or, or they, you know, they like building code. Like that. like that to me, that's completely inconceivable, but there are people who really like Excel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were we were taken advantage of quite a bit early on, um, and it wasn't until we got our own, you know, business person uh, to sort of protect us <laughs> that that Penny Arcade really started to take off in a way that was um, capable of, of sustaining a business. How do you find those people? Uh, you know, especially at that point, it's probably easier now because you've already found some people like that, and you learn and you yep. make connections. But, but well, I mean, I'm sure we've got lots of folks. Uh, although Beef says he doesn't think anyone will pay him for what he does in his room at night, but uh, I'm sure we have lots of folks. Who knows, Beef? Maybe there's a business plan there. How, Put a webcam on. Somebody will pay. Yeah, exactly. But how does he build that business then? And how does he find those people that he can trust? Well, we were very mind? lucky that Robert found us um he was a reader he was a reader and uh he he was going to have uh, a company a game company that he was working for as a consultant advertise on penny arcade and so he wanted to meet with us and talk about advertising rates and so he offered us a free lunch um we immediately accepted and i think after about 45 minutes of talking with us over lunch he realized that we had absolutely no idea how to, uh, he would say, monetize what we had. And uh, so he quit his job and told us that he was going to work for us. <laughs> That's great, how, how, what, what year was that? What, around what point? That was about 10 years ago. Wow. So, because that is becoming, not, I, I don't think it's a common story, but it's becoming a more common story where people meet on the internet and they have shared interests and they're, <laughs> they're light, admiring what each other do and they help each other out. But that was... That was long before that was a common occurrence. Well, we were yeah. lucky that he was local. Yeah. Uh-huh. It, well, I mean, we were, we've been lucky for the last 15 years. But, I mean, Robert especially, you know, before we met him, we were trying to do some advertising <laughs> on our own. And uh, as soon as those people sort of catch wind of the fact that you don't... They can smell it. ...understand business or really numbers or basic math, uh, they just, they just uh, destroy you. I mean... The, it it's was, their job to. Yeah, they were trying to get the best deal they could, and they did from us. Um, and so, yeah, until we had Robert, who actually understood, you know, that that side of the business, we were we were in real trouble. So the main thing about starting a business, you know, in that way is that, you know, the reality is that we had to do Penny Arcade for free for a long time. Yeah, we not only did we have to do it for free, but we had to make some pretty incredible mistakes. Uh, along the way. 
Now, you guys have, have, have uh, taken some, some funny shots at things like Kickstarter uh, and stuff in, in your strips. And, 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 and I'm, you know, I'm not one of those people that's, like, trying to call you out because you then did a Kickstarter later. I'm just saying, oh. like, you, you guys see the downsides to Kickstarter, obviously. But then you guys have done a couple of successful Kickstarter projects. And the, the whole point of bringing this up is to get it to that point of what, what do you think that's best for? Because you say, oh, we had to do things for free for a long time. And I've had that experience. I think a lot of people have had that experience. But the idea now is people think, oh, if I'm just starting out, I'll put my idea on Kickstarter and get lots of money off the top. And it doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. You kind of already have to be successful to make the Kickstarter thing work in your I'm favor. very happy that we did it the way we did. You know, every one of those mistakes from, you know, losing the book rights to accidentally selling the company. Um, all of that stuff taught us an incredible amount. Yeah. You know, and we needed all of those lessons. Absolutely. Wait, there, there, hold, I, I knew about the book rights thing, I think, but I didn't know you accidentally sold the company. Yeah, yeah that happened. Yeah, Robert doesn't like us to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get it back? And do you, do you want that story? How much time do we have? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it's pretty intriguing, but I don't want to force you guys into a bad position if you can't, if there's things you can't talk uh, no, about. We can, it's all out there. Yeah, I mean, we can say, that. so, uh, you know, we started PennyArcade.com on our own, and uh, back then there was a thing called content aggregators. I don't know if you remember this. Basically, sure. they were reptiles. Yeah, Huge networks would collect a bunch of different sites and then sell ads across the entire network. And Federated the, media were the good guys of that kind of thing, but there were a lot of bad guys. UGO yeah. was one that was, was pretty good. Um, E-Front, the one that we got uh, you know, associated with, was not so good. Not so good. And uh, they, they paid us, I think, a couple months, long enough for us to feel safe enough to quit our jobs, and then stopped paying us, and the company went bankrupt. Um, and the president of the company fled the country, I think, <laughs> under allegations of tax, tax fraud. Yeah. I, had, I had a book published at an ebook company whose guy was hiding in his garage in New Mexico at one point. It was sort of a <laughs> yeah. common thing there. For, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we didn't realize that, you know, when we had signed the contract for the, for the site, we thought we were signing over the rights, you know, to advertise on the site. But what we were actually signing over was the rights to Penny Arcade. And so when they stopped paying us and we started to get a little bit lippy, uh, they said, OK, we're just going to fire you two and hire someone else to make Penny Arcade. We can do that. And sure enough, they could. <laughs> that was very scary. And uh, it just oh, another one of our lucky. Jesus Christ, we've been lucky when you really think about it. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no. no. Uh, it just, it was, Jesus Christ isn't bad, is it? Well, is it uh, anyway, as that was literally, as that was happening, as they were finding a new artist and he was making strips to take over, uh, their company dissolved and the rights, um, they owed us money oh. and gave us the rights back in exchange for money owed. You, you guys really are lucky that... <laughs> Because that's a disaster story, right? I mean, the way that story normally is told is you, you lost the company, you got fired, and then the company went bankrupt, you know, two weeks later. And if it only had it happened two weeks earlier, you would have been able to get the company back. But you, you're on the good side of that story. That's a Yeah. Thing. Yeah, we were very, it was very fortuitous. That's, that's for sure. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the good things that you guys have been able to do with your luck, uh, specifically a Child's Play. Uh, yeah. which is a great charity. Uh, you guys do fantastic work. There's always really fun stuff that's benefiting uh, Child's Play. How did you come up with that? How did that come about? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we we felt the very first part, what, was it Was it really like that we were angry? I think, it, I think it, like most things that we make, <laughs> It comes from anger. <laughs> so I wasn't kidding when I said that all of this anger ended up helping children. I'm glad. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, at the at the time the child's play started, it was sort of at the height of the uh, video games are bad for kids. Um, you get their murder simulators. Murder they, they simulators. Teach kids yeah. to kill that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we knew that that wasn't the case, and we knew that gamers were not villains. And we knew that we had a large number of gamers who 
we could rally, essentially. Yeah. And the, the initial idea, remember, was to get used consoles. Right. We thought, geez, you've got all these uh, people reading Penny Arcade, and all of them have used consoles probably collecting dust somewhere in their house. What if we could have them send all those old consoles and old games to hospitals so kids could play them? So toys for tots, but for games. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, But then as soon as we started talking to the hospital, uh, the Seattle Children's Hospital, they told us that... um, Used toys are not a thing. They can't accept used toys. These kids are in such sort of, uh, you know, precarious situations that they can't be exposed to anything like that. Everything has to be new. Mm. And so that's when the the concept for the charity sort of shifted, and we thought, well, what if we just let the the hospital make a wish list and tell us what they want, and then we just point our, you know, Death Star laser of gamers at it. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah, it worked. It's been working working for years and years. How do you you come up with the uh, kinds of things that are done for child's play uh, how do you how do you countenance the ones that say, well, we're doing this and the money will go to Child's Play? Do you try to get involved? Or have you run into people who are who are doing an event to raise money and they say it's going to go to Child's Play and you would really rather they didn't or you weren't didn't want to be associated with it? How do you handle that side of things? Well, I think that's why we hired Jamie. Because it was, it was clear, like, one of the strengths of the charity is that is that people can, is that it's, it's sort of peer-to-peer in that way where people can... Um, Start something up if they want to, and contribute and, and contribute the proceeds to Child's Play. Um, there's a lot of energy out there, and and you know, like, like I was saying before, like people have things that they want to do, and when it's something that they believe in, they have an unlimited amount of energy for it. So they want to do these projects, and so eventually we needed somebody to manage that influx of enthusiasm. But like a lot of things that are deeply associated with Child's Play now, like let's say the bus. Desert Bus, Humble Bundle, mm-hmm. like those, that's, we did not make those things. Yeah, but we only really run one event a year, and that's our dinner and auction. Well, and, and now the golf, and now, now golf. the golf tournament, so that's, yeah, it's two. But, you know, when you see all these hundreds of child play events, that's not us. You know, that's, that's the community um, raising that money. Yeah, and so we have a, we have an official calendar. If you, if you go to childsplaycharity.org, um, there is an official calendar of, of everybody who has set up an event and talked to Jamie about it to get it set up. And so those are all the ones that we those are the ones that we know about. Yeah, cool. Childsplaycharity.org. Uh, be, be sure to head head over there. I want to talk to you guys about Penny Arcade Expo before we wrap up. We have uh, to thank one more uh, sponsor. So oh boy! Oh boy! Leo. Before we wrap things up on triangulation, I want to mention uh, our one of our great sponsors, somebody that we've been uh, with for four or five years. Actually, I've been an Audible customer for 12 years. When did they start? I think I got my Audible account in 2001. I love Audible. Uh, audiobooks, 100,000 plus titles to choose from. Just great. I mean, great stuff. History, fiction, uh, thrillers, young adult, science fiction, books in every single category, read not in a bland, boring way, but performed by great actors. These books come to life. I just finished Cloud Atlas. Have you seen the movie yet? If you haven't, well, even if you have, you might want to read the book just to understand what you just saw. Cloud, it's an amazing novel. They said this will never be made into a film. They have, but you really want to see the film in your head. Books come to life at audible.com. You can get that book for free right now if you visit audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. You'll be signing up for the gold account. That's a book a month. But your first month's free. Your first book's free. In fact, uh, it's yours to keep forever. I know I know. once you start using uh, triangula- uh, triangulation, audible, uh, you will, you'll never go back. You're just going to love it. Audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. Audible's saved my life when I was commuting every day to the screensavers. In a way, it made me like the commute. Two to three hours a day of reading time. What's not to like about that? Now it saves me when I'm at the gym, when I'm walking the dog, doing the dishes. I can run it on my Sonos. I just, I am a big fan. I know you will be too. Try it free right now for the first month. Your first book's free. First credit anyway. Some books are more than one credit. Most of them are not. At Audible Podcast. Dot com slash triangulation. And we thank Audible for 
continually supporting all of our efforts here at uh, Twit. They're really a great sponsor. Now back to our special guest on triangulation. Wait a minute. You guys look so much. Did you did, 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 did switch the no? No, everything? No. All right. All right. Never mind. No, it's fine. I just, I just confused. I was, I was listening to the, uh, the Audible ad. So. Yes. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, if you're just tuning in, we're talking to the Penny Arcade guys, uh, uh, John Crick Faluski and uh, Gabe Newell. <laughs> Uh, Joe Ren Halbertson. <laughs> uh, no, we've got, uh, we've got, I, I want to make sure I get your name right. Mike Krahulik and Jerry yeah. Hawkins, uh, uh, Tycho and Gabe uh, from Penny Arcade. Uh, and one of the coolest things I feel like that you've lucked in, as, we, as we've, we've told the story, into being able to do is Penny Arcade Expo, which is the ultimate fan convention, not just for video game players, but you guys have a great tabletop. Uh, experience there as well. So, oh, so you must you must have been to East then. I have not been to East or oh. West, uh, West either one. I've just heard oh, my friends yeah. raving about it. Well, especially on the um, there's there's two different buildings, right? So the 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 show is hosted in different places, and so um, we have different kinds of we have different kinds of spaces available to us. But the one specifically over in uh, Boston, which is called the BCEC is a, a very modern facility that basically looks like a spaceship from the outside. And then inside one of its hulls, um, you can you can host, you can, you can have conventions in every one of those little things if you wanted to. Yeah, tons of space. But the tabletop section at East is especially twisted. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, we've always felt like tabletop is a part of gaming. You know, we want to make sure that we put them together for a reason so that people who play video games can sort of walk through tabletop and see like, oh, this is cool. I, I actually like this, you know, and, and people who consider themselves tabletop gamers might stumble into the video game section. And be like, right. oh, that's actually really interesting. Right. We want them to catch a whiff, right? Yeah. Because the, the, the assertion there is that it's like, okay, so you play video games, but you're actually a gamer. You're actually enthusiastic about systems, um, and the enjoyment that these meticulous systems can create. Um, and also, really, I mean, for me, like, the ultimate success is when we get someone who has been playing video games around a table to, to have like a social gaming type experience, whether that's D&D or some Euro game or whatever. It doesn't make any difference to us. Just give, that, give them that experience. And they, they come away from those tables, you know, with a, with a, a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment, I don't know. I, I forget what we're talking about. <laughs> a sense of gamingness and yeah, game wood. They smell a little gamey, but that's okay. Yep. Uh, I, wa- I want to f- talk about the origin stories of all of this stuff, and and I think Penny Arcade Expo is probably the one that most people feel like, oh yeah, if I if I were these guys, this is what I want to do. Because I ca- I can't think of a single venture that I've been associated with that at some point. The idea of like we should do a, a big conference and and have all of our fans get together in one place, but you've not only done it, you've 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 pulled it off, turned it into something popular, and, and you've done it well. How did it get started? How did it turn from that that idea into to something you're actually doing? Uh, well, you know, as as comic artists, we were traveling to a lot of conventions, um, comic book conventions, um, anime conventions, all kinds of stuff all across the country. And uh, just from our point of view, we saw that, you know, a lot of these had gaming sections. Like they might have a, a you know, a room or an annex or something that was had some video games that you could play. Or a foyer. Or a DDR machine or something. But we never went to a convention uh, that was specifically focused on the gaming community. Right. That actually honored that aspect. Right. Right, because and, uh, you mentioned you got to go to E3, but you probably learned right away that's not for fans. Mm-mm. No, E3, well, yeah, E3 is not for fans. It's also a terrible place to play video games, um, and it's not really about the. It's not about the community around games. It's about the business of games, mm-hmm. and, and that's fine. That's fine. We need but that it, too. But it has it has its own show. Yeah, um, and so we wanted to make the, you know. I think in the beginning we were, we were sort of calling it Woodstock for gamers, like a, a place where you could go and listen to all the music, the video game music that you love. You could play the games that you love, and it would be this sort of community event. Yeah, the way I usually put it is that we were trying to make a corporeal internet. 
right? We wanted to make an internet that you could go to and walk around in. That's, that's really cool. That, that's probably one of the reasons that it's been so popular because I'm sure a lot of people have that same desire when they're, when they're on the internet. Like, I wish I could walk See into it. this. Yeah. Go to PAX sometime, yeah. You should just come. Take a look at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to. You know, the problem for me is I always, I, I got hooked up with Dragon Con and there's, I have oh, some oh. great friends there. And so there's mm-hmm. only been the one year where they haven't overlapped. And that's not your fault. It's not their fault. That's just timing and, and availability. Uh, well, we have we have East, we got Boston, Prime, and then Australia as well. So Pax Os, Pax Os. When is that yeah. one? Uh, that's uh, let's see, July nineteenth, the twenty first. Yeah. Really? Oh, so that's near Comic Con, huh? It is. It well, is. You, you know what the point is. You've got four of them. I don't have any excuses. I could probably find one to go to. You see, we are giving you an excuse. Not to trudge through Comic Con. <laughs> that's that's actually a really good point. <laughs> um, so, but how? So, when was the first PAX? Two thousand four. Two thousand four. Yeah. Two thousand four. And 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 so, did you just whip it together yourselves? And and yeah, I mean that that goes back to talking about the quality of the people that we've sort of surrounded ourselves with. When you know all these ideas, you know, Child's Play, PAX, any of this stuff, you know. Jerry and I go into Robert's office and we say, Robert, we should have a convention and it should be, you know, it should have this structure and it should have all these things and let's do it. And then Robert's actually able to take that with the team that, that we've got here and make it real. Um, and yeah, the, that first PAX was definitely thrown together. I mean, I think Microsoft had no real presence. It was just, I think... They had some testers, I think. Yeah, some people threw their boxes from Microsoft, threw their boxes in their car and drove down and just set them up so people could play. Uh-huh. I mean, it was it was pretty low rent. It was, I think, 3,000 people. They had Fable. People. They had that, that back in the day when um, Forza, the first Forza had that way to play it on multiple screens. Yeah. That was really the extent of our exhibition hall. Well, and I mean, was, if I remember, do I have the timing right? Was that pre-Wii? Uh, it definitely was pre-Wii, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So so we were we were still in GameCube PS2 land. Yeah, th- yeah, yeah. There was no Xbox 360 yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's that's insane. That, that, that a long it, time ago. And how how have you expanded? How did how did you end up going from there to to Pax Os? Did do you guys have that idea, or do the fans come up with those ideas? And and yeah, we just we put out a questionnaire, and the most interest um, in a show came from Australia. And yeah, when I said the, the first show had 3,000 people, you know, it, it kept doubling every year. And so we got to the point where the Seattle Convention Center was full. People couldn't come to PAX anymore. And so we thought that by making PAX on the other side of the country, we could sort of relieve some of the pressure on PAX Prime. No. And and now we just sort of discovered that if you make a PAX, they will come. Damn aeroplanes. Yes. Yeah, both of those are sold out. So Prime, Prime sells out and then East sells out. Um, we, we just added an extra day to Prime uh, in an effort to make it so that more people could come. But, I mean, we're really up against the limits of physical reality as far as the shows. And PAX Dev, obviously for developers, but how, how does that differ specifically? PAX Dev actually has a strict no-press policy. I have never been to PAX Dev. Yeah, we don't get to go to PAX Dev. You, don't get to, you guys don't even get to go. No, I mean, we wanted to make a space for them uh-huh. where they could speak and sort of share ideas without worrying that it would end up on some blog. That's smart. Yeah, right? a, lot, a lot because there's a lot of frank speech that goes on at GDC, and invariably it gets chewed up into sound bites, and it becomes some kind of a scandal. Yeah. And it seems so, like, they just... Frank, frank speech is at the core of a creative medium. It doesn't make any difference which one it is. And so we thought it would be interesting to try to put something like that together. I'm told they have a lot of fun there. Did you do you borrow that idea from like the DEF CONs and Black Hat type conventions, or is that just convergent evolution? No, we borrowed it because we had seen. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure they have a similar thing. They do, yeah. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, no. It was specifically a response to what a circus gaming media makes of GDC. Yeah, and it's, it's the same reason. It's that need for frank discussion where you don't have to be looking over your shoulder. Yeah. It's absolutely vital. That's really cool. I try to imagine how we would make comics here in this room if we couldn't actually talk to each other. If you were, like, on the set of Big Brother? Exactly. And we're trying to make three stupid panels, 
You know, and we're not working for four years on a game. You know what I mean? Although your podcast was sort of fly on the wall of you, you guys coming up with the panel. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have, we have the opportunity to speak, frankly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're, we're very fortunate in that, you know, you can get offended at something we say or you can not like something we say, but there's no one that you can go to above our head. Yeah, <laughs> that, and, and that's the distinction, yeah. right, is that we, for good or ill, we, you know, we have the rudder. Man, there's so much, uh, so much else I'd love to talk to you about, but I, I, I know we're uh, we've running out of time here. Uh, I will, I will come to PAX. PAX East is coming up March 22nd through the 24th yep. in Boston. Yep. 134 days away, uh, but you say they're all sold out, huh? Uh, no, no, there, there's still some individual day passes, but we know a guy. Maybe we can work something out. Okay, uh, I, I know, I'll have, I'll have, I know a guy who can talk to your guy. And maybe we can. All right. Let's have those guys talk. <laughs> Let's have those guys get together. Uh, but PaxSite.com for folks out there. P-A-X-S-I-T-E.com. Uh, the charity, uh, Child's Play Charity, Child's Play Charity.org. Child's Play Charity.org forward slash donate. Um, you'll have access to the world map there with uh, 90 some uh, global sites in the network. Um, in addition to a direct donate button that we use for um, large negotiated purchases. And uh, wow, that's a, that, that's a lot of markers on that map. Take a look. I mean, it, it's There's one in Egypt. To get there. Yeah, we've, we've got hospitals all over now. Oh, that's great. That's amazing. So check that out. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So you can, you can try to find a hospital near you. And uh, if the hospital that you want to donate to is uh, not on there, then just let us know. And, Children's uh, and Hospital we, of we, Oakland, right there. Get it on there. Okay. Uh, and of course, uh, the comic that started it all, and and the posts, uh, the news posts, and the archive, and the forums, and the store, and all that stuff at penny arcade dot com. Anything else you guys want to let folks know about before we wrap it up here? I, I got my child's play shout out in. Jamie will be very pleased. Yeah, I think that that's it. Very cool. Well, thanks you guys uh, for taking the time to sit down and chat. Really appreciate it. No Thank pleasure. You. See you, man. That's it for this episode of Triangulation. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TRI, and we stream the show live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Leo will be gone for another couple weeks, but Sarah and Ayaz are filling in, so we'll have another host and another great guest next week. We'll see you then. 